Thanks, Dr. Goldstein. So again, my name is Alex Blutinger. I am one of the second year critical care residents here at the hospital. Um, our role as residents is to be involved primarily in the critical care service, so hospitalized patients that are critically ill, as well as taking in patients in the emergency room when they present, which is gonna be primarily the focus of this topic. Um, so thank you all for coming. You know, normally when people come into the hospital, it's not because they wanna be here. And so this is actually a real treat. Um, it can be a very stressful environment. It can be a, a morbid time to be in the hospital with your pet. Um, and generally speaking, when I'm interacting with people at 8.30 in the morning in my particular specialty, they're not excited to see me in the morning. So this is actually um, a nice change for me. My goal today is to give you a little bit of a background um, into what goes on in the emergency room so that if and when the time comes that you do need to bring your pet to the emergency room, you feel as comfortable as possible knowing that they're in good hands and they're getting the care that they need. When I was asked to give this lecture, um, I had to sit back and think hard about how I was going to present the nuances of what happens in the ER. One of the requirements as a resident is to give lectures to other doctors. Um, and those lectures are always clinical in nature. And so to actually put to words what goes on in a setting that seems second nature to me, the protocols, the procedures, all things that I'm used to every day, um, it took some time to kind of put these things in a way that would be easy for the public to feel comfortable about when they're bringing their pets in. The picture I think here sums up our profession quite well. I think there, to an outsider, there's a stigma of coming into an emergency room. There's often a lot of chaos. If you've ever been into a human ER, if you've walked in during peak hours, there's a lot of people in the waiting room. They're sitting on the floor sometimes. There's no seats available. The only big difference is that you may not hear barking and animals jumping around. But in this chaos, as doctors, we see unity. And we see a group coming together to provide the best care for your pet. One of the most amazing aspects of our profession and our particular specialty is the wide variety of cases that we'll see on a daily basis. There's no other specialty in medicine that sees the variety that we do on a given day. I've listed some of the more common things here. Uh, patients that have come in after being hit by a car. They may have injuries from falling or playing in the dog park. They may have burn injuries. They may be bleeding from some reason or another. They may have difficulty breathing, loss of motor function. They may have collapsed at home. They may have been exposed to some toxicity, eaten one of the pill bottles at home that you may be taking or maybe giving to someone else in the house. They may have vomiting or diarrhea. They may have significant pain that maybe is too, too much to control at home. Um, or they may have some sort of an allergic reaction to who knows what. Um, but this is by all means a not a totally inclusive list. There's a lot of things that I haven't listed here, but these are some of the more common things that we'll see on any given day. And you'd be amazed, just like in human medicine, every day we're surprised by new things that we're seeing. We think we've seen it all. Something new walks in those doors and we have to figure out exactly what's going on. I think the easiest way to go through this is to present a case example. So imagine it's two o'clock in the morning, you're sleeping soundly, and your dog Fifi wakes you up. What do you do? Do you take her out for a walk because she probably has to pee? Do you call your primary veterinarian at two in the morning? We've all been there, it's okay. Do you try and ride it out? Or do you take her into the emergency room? Most of the time, if you're being woken up at two in the morning and it's not a routine thing for your particular pet, there's something going on. And nine times out of 10, you'll end up coming in through the emergency room. Now, the examples that I'm gonna be providing and the systems that I'll be ex explaining today are particular to our hospital, but the triage system and the way that the emergency service works is pretty unanimous across the board. Um, so even though I'll be referring to our particular hospital, this is pretty much how most emergency rooms that have a high caseload will function. So I think it's nice to have a little bit of a historical background when talking about um, the emergency system. But the first place you're going to be greeted when you walk in is at our triage station. The word triage um, comes from the word trier in French, which means to sort. And it essentially refers to the sorting of patients for treatment priority when resources are insufficient to treat everyone at the same time in an emergency setting. 
And this concept was introduced in the early 1800s on the battlefields of Europe. And what they found was that injured soldiers in the field of battle, if their, if their injuries were prioritized in, the, in how severe they were, they were more likely to have a higher survival. And that was for the larger, the larger group. And what, what happened was this, this term, this principle, um, was picked up by hospital providers in the 1970s because they realized how if we utilized this particular way of managing a high volume setting, they were actually able to improve survival and reduce mortality rates. This has subsequently been um, developed not only in the human field, but in our field as well. And the system that we use has been validated to actually improve survival of the pets that are coming in through a high volume setting like the Animal Medical Center. So when you walk in, you've probably been in this situation before at some point, whether it's a human hospital, it's a veterinary hospital, there is a triage system of some sort to determine how quickly your pet, or if it's in a human hospital, how quickly you need to be evaluated and be seen by a doctor. And when you walk in, you'll be greeted and triaged into an exam room. Our exam room um, is shown here in this photo. A nurse will come in, will meet you, will meet your pet, will watch your pet, watch him walk, him or her walk, watch how he or she will interact with the environment, make sure that everything seems appropriate mentally in your pet, and then we'll take a set of vitals. That includes a heart rate, that includes temperature, respiratory rate, and then get a very brief history from you. And in doing that, what they're, what they're essentially trying to accomplish is what degree of severity is your patient presenting on the ER? How soon does your pet need to be seen? And they will assign a color code. And the code that is shown in the picture here is actually on the wall of our triage room. And it's labeled from red to orange to yellow to green to blue. Blue being the most stable patient, red being one that needs to be seen immediately because they're at the highest risk of, of dying. So this particular categorization scheme is important because we don't want an animal with a life-threatening condition waiting just because they come in 10 minutes after a patient that's very stable. And it's set up this way on purpose to, again, maximize survival and help patients in the order in which they need to be assisted. I think a really good way of thinking about this is demonstrated in this photo. This is not from our front desk, even though maybe we should start putting it there. But what this is essentially is saying, it's a dinosaur holding a sign that says, waiting is good. It means you are not going to die. The person, in our case the animals, that you need to feel sorry for are the ones who get rushed into the ER, the ER and treated first. And I think it's sometimes hard to think about this when you've been sitting in the waiting room for a long time. And honestly, we recognize that it can be very frustrating when you're sitting there and you have things to do. We all want to get, make this as efficient as possible, this whole process. But just keep in mind that those are the, the cases that you should be worried about, the ones that are getting rushed back. If you're sitting with your pet in the waiting room, that's a good sign. Your pet is stable enough to be sitting there. And if you're sitting there for longer periods of time, just like in human medicine, a nurse or a doctor on, on occasion will come up and make sure that the status of your pet hasn't changed and that maybe they've gotten sicker in that time frame that they're waiting in the, in the lobby. But they're always keeping an eye and making sure that nothing has changed clinically with your pet if you're sitting there waiting for a long period of time. At this point, once the nurse has triaged you, one of two things will happen. Um, triage your pet, excuse me. Either your pet will be brought immediately back into the emergency treatment area, and that would be a scenario in which the nurse feels comfortable enough to say that your pet needs more immediate treatment. The alternative being your pet seems very stable, vitals are normal, they're not concerned about the history, and they'll ask you to wait in the lobby patiently for a doctor. Either of these scenarios will occur. The next step for you is to go and register. And this is arguably one of the more important parts of the triage process because during registration, you are creating a medical record for your pet. And the reason that's important is because the medical record is a time and a place where we centralize all the information about your pet, all the vitals we're obtaining throughout the pet's hospitalization period. Every visit that you come, the information that your pet obtains whether it's through diagnostics, through physical exams, goes into this medical record. And that information needs to be easily accessible, not only for us to be able to evaluate and to trend, but also to send to your primary veterinarian when you go for your follow-up appointments. Once you've registered, regardless of whether you're with or without your pet, 
our nurse in the interim has gone back and in some form, again, this is different in every hospital setting, but for our particular hospital, they go back and on this whiteboard, as soon as you walk into the ER, on your right hand side is this large whiteboard. And there is where she writes the patient's name and medical record number. Again, that's where you've registered and obtained your medical record number. Then they'll write the presenting complaint of your pet, why you came in with your pet at that particular time. And then they'll assign the color code that we talked about, referencing how urgently your pet needs to be seen. And once a doctor is ready to see a case, they will reference the color code and see who's waiting in the lobby and then make the determination of who should be seen in what order. And again, the color code that we've, that we've given you for your pet is essentially the way that they're going to decide who gets to be seen on a more urgent basis. This is an essential component of all aspects of medicine. In human medicine, they have ways of compiling your medical records, they have a centralized system, they have a triage system, sometimes they're on large screens, sometimes they're handwritten like in our hospital, but our, our system actually works quite well for us, um, and so we've kept this for some time now. So at this point in time, either you're with your pet in the lobby, or you're not with your pet in the lobby, and you're probably asking yourself, what are they doing to my pet in the back, especially if you're not with them? It's a very reasonable question to ask, because most of you haven't been to our ER or exam room or to our emergency treatment area, and so you don't have a sense of what's going on when you're not with your pet. Regardless of whether or not your pet is sitting next to you, at this point in time, a doctor will come out, introduce themselves to you, and accompany you to an exam room. Once in an exam room, they will obtain a more detailed medical history from you, that includes why you're presenting to the emergency room, what prior medical history does your pet have, is your pet on any medications at home. They'll do a thorough physical exam, same sort of things that a nurse will do, but rather than just obtaining vitals, they'll assess different body systems as well. And I'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. And I wrote this here, some of the exam room challenges that we face as veterinarians, because I think it's important sometimes to understand why in certain scenarios will ask to pull your pets away from you and bring them into the emergency treatment area. I know if I was in an emergency hospital with my particular pet, with an unfamiliar person in front of me getting an exam, and they asked me, can I take your pet, I'm gonna bring him in the back, I'd wanna know why. I mean, it's nice to have an exam done right in front of you. You wanna know what's going on with your pet, sort of in live time. The reasons that we do this are, are several fold, and I'm gonna go through a couple of them, but some of the biggest things include anxiety and aggression. And this is from the pet standpoint. Pets around their owners can sometimes get very anxious only in the company of their owner. They can also get aggressive. Our goal here is to make this as stress-free of an environment as possible and make it so that any pet being evaluated doesn't associate this experience with negativity. And so if we feel that a patient will be more handleable, more comfortable outside of the presence of their owner, we oftentimes want to pull them away and bring them in an area where we think they'll be more comfortable and we can get a more accurate exam. That it goes the same for restraint. If a patient is over anxious or over eager and is jumping or isn't cooperating, rather than try and hold them down in a way that we think is unsafe or unpleasant for them, we have professional people in the back, literally professional people that have learned how to handle animals in a stress-free way, in a comfortable way handling these animals so that we can appropriately do our exam in a way that allows us to get the information that we need. Instruments. There are a lot of things that on exam we'll sometimes find early on or we have or clue to based on your history that you're giving us. And a lot of these instruments we don't have in the exam rooms. They're only in the emergency treatment area. And so sometimes we're required to bring your pet back to use these instruments. And the veterinarian should tell you this is why I'd like to bring your pet back, but these are some of the more common things that we'll, we'll think about when we're doing that. A rectal exam, that's an essential part of the exam. No one likes to do the rectal exam, especially no one wants to watch the rectal exam. And so sometimes owners actually prefer if we take these pets to the back and we do our exam back there. And then sort of what's involved in all of this is teamwork. We have a team that works in the emergency system like any hospital does. And the purpose of this team, again, is to make sure that we get things done efficiently and effectively, get you out of the hospital as quickly as possible, and get your pet the treatment it needs as quick as possible. And that doesn't happen with an individual, it happens with a team. And so it's really important that we consider these things when we're asking you if we can take your pet out of your site for a few minutes to get our exam done. 
I think at this point in your visit, you've met a lot of people. And it can be confusing because it's hard to know sometimes who's the doctor, who's the nurse. And I guess the best analogy I can make is comparing it to a cricket match. Is anyone, is anyone familiar with how a, match, a cricket match works, the sport of cricket? Wow, that's, that's, I've never had people say that they really understand it, so I'm jealous. Uh, but I will say that for me, cricket is completely misunderstood. If there's not someone sitting next to me explaining to me every role that a cricket player has on the field at a time, it's like listening to an unfamiliar language. And so I wanted to present this scheme for you all to have a sense of how the hierarchy system in our hospital works. Essentially, I think the takeaway from this, from this picture is that the senior specialist, staff emergency doctor, resident, and intern are all veterinary doctors. They've all gone through four years of intensive undergrad training, striving to accomplish the highest GPA possible, to then apply to one of only 30 veterinary schools in the country, all of which are very competitive. Veterinary school generally comprises about two years of classwork, of coursework, where you're learning physiology, disease processes, followed by about two years of in-the-clinic work. So that's when you're shadowing various doctors around the hospital, learning and applying what you've what you've received in your uh, preclinical work. And following those four years of school, you then have to take a licensing exam, which all four of these groups have taken. That is a very challenging exam. It's a full day written exam that, that comprises over 10 species. And although we're only working with a subset of that number, we are responsible for learning about many, many species that we don't necessarily deal with on a daily basis. And if at that point a veterinarian wishes to pursue a specialty, which is what I'm doing in my second year currently, they have to apply for a competitive internship program. We have an internship program here at this hospital which is highly competitive. And again, these are all doctors that are now working as interns to further specialize, to further get experience whether or not they want to pursue an emergency and critical care residency, a neurology residency, internal medicine specialty, they're all requi required to do an internship. After the one year internship, they then have to reapply for a residency program. And these are also even more highly specialized and more competitive in a way because there are less spaces available for residents in this country. And following your residency, you take a law board exam where you eventually become a senior specialist, which is what most of us in this hospital that are um, that are here in training are, are trying to accomplish. But I think it's important to recognize that because generally when you come in to the emergency room with your pet, you will be speaking with an intern. And an intern is a doctor and they are qualified to be here. They've passed their licensing exam. They're smart people. They're competent. And it's important to recognize that even though you're, sp you're speaking to an intern, they are not the only one involved in your pet's case. They are always on staff with either a resident or a staff emergency doctor or a senior specialist. And I can guarantee you that if you've ever come into this hospital with your pet, and I think this goes for any hospital that has an internship program, you will be evaluated, your pet will be evaluated by not only the intern, but, but at least one of the other three of the doctors in that group. Either the specialist, the resident, or the staff emergency doctor. This is always a team effort. We wanna make sure that nothing is being missed that all the appropriate diagnostics and treatments are being recommended to you for your pet. And the only way to do that and to ensure that is to make sure that multiple people are evaluating your pet when they come into the emergency room. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. The, the nurse and the assistant in this hierarchy scheme are equally important. This whole system, this pyramid, without one entity collapses. It's important for every component of this pyramid to be present, to be working, and they're involved in every aspect of every case in some way. And so I think it's just an important thing to remember that although you may be interacting with one person here, one person there, everyone is involved in every case. So I, I put this little video together because I wanted you to get sort of a first person view of what it's like walking through the doors into our emergency service. So if you're not with your pet and we're bringing your pet back to be evaluated, whether it's something that needs to be seen very quickly or whether it's a situation where we've asked to bring your pet back after doing an exam on them in the exam room, this is sort of the, the vantage point that we have as doctors taking your pet in. And this obviously isn't the, the picture of a sick patient, 
this dog looks quite happy to be here. And it's not always like that. Some animals are rushed back on a gurney. Some have collapsed at home. Some animals, unfortunately, are already dead when they present. Some are carried in arms as they run back. Some are putting on the brakes as they're coming into the hospital because they really don't want to be there. They have this negative association with the hospital. But we try and make this experience as pleasant as possible, like this nurse is doing. And if we haven't already obtained vitals, this is the first table in the emergency room. It's sort of our crash table, or the table where most of our patients are evaluated. This is where our, um, our doctor will obtain a heart rate, a respiratory rate, get their temperature, and then present to the doctor in the room the case and say, this patient presented for the following reasons, here are its vitals, and then assign the color code at that point. Just sort of in picture form, this is a photo of the emergency room um, entrance. It is strategically located in the center of our hallway. All the services are surrounding the emergency room service, and the ICU is directly across the hall. This is done intentionally because we obviously want to be able to have any service access our room. We want patients to have sort of a seamless flow to and from the ICU if they need to be that way. Um, and we want to have doctors, we want to have doctors be able to access this room at any point in time. So it's, it's strategically positioned here in the center of the hallway. As soon as you walk in the emergency room, you can kind of see the entrance to the right of the photo. Um, there is a triage board that I mentioned to you before. Um, this is where, again, we put patient information, the presenting complaint, and the color code of how urgent your pet needs to be seen. You can see in the sort of the foreground of the photo, there is a large cart. In this cart are medications, which I'll talk about in just a couple of minutes. Um, and there's other supplies on top of, the crash, of this crash cart, so to speak. It's a cart that has various drugs for emergency scenarios. Um, and then in this photo, this is sort of the vantage point of walking into the ER and looking out into the ER. It looks like it's pretty chaotic in there, but believe it or not, this is, um, there is structure and um, an order in this room, and we know where everything is. The nurses know where everything is. This is done intentionally, and we want to be able to access things easily. The intern here in the foreground is uh, reviewing medical records, and you can see there are tables set up, um, and you can kind of imagine these tables being hospital beds. So if you were in a human hospital, and let's say you, you suffered, God forbid, some sort of trauma, or you've ever seen on TV or, or a, a movie, a, a trauma scenario where they're rushing someone in, you can kind of think of this room as the trauma bay or the resuscitation bay. Um, but in human medicine, sometimes they split up different injuries into different areas of the hospital and where they're treated. For us, this is sort of an all-inclusive, everything happens in this particular room. Um, so this is the table that we will generally have patients come into. If it's a stat emergency, they need to be seen immediately. They're immediately brought into this first table where we can do things with them, examine them, and get the information that we need. Um, to the left of the entrance to our emergency room are a set of computers. These are doctors working on their medical records. This is a spot in the hospital where we can order diagnostic information, we can put in lab requests, um, we update medical records with vitals, with our physical exam information. Um, and if you've been particularly observant during this presentation, you might be wondering where all the men are in this hospital. Um, I'm, I'm not the only one, I promise you. Um, this happened to be just a particular day in staffing. But this is where all the information is put into our medical record system. And then again, another, another view of um, our room. In the back of the room, there are some oxygen cages. To the right of that photo, there are um, smaller cages. Patients that are either in the process of being admitted or stabilized, we don't want to transfer them until we feel that they're stable enough to be transferred to a different ward or to a different service. So we will put them in these cages just temporarily with bedding so that they're comfortable, and we'll administer the fluids that they need, antibiotics, whatever they need to become more stable or be, get to a stable place to then be transferred. We'll do that in the emergency room. We have things in the hospital to warm up our patients in sort of the bottom of the photo in the foreground, there's um, this white machine that's called a bear hugger. And a lot of our patients come in cold. When they're sick, they come in cold, heating them up, getting to a normal temperature is essential part of treatment, so we can do that. Um, we have fluid bags hanging um, right in front of the tables. We have an anesthesia machine in the back of the room, so we can actually perform um, anesthetic things, whether or not we're doing some sort of minor surgical procedure. Um, sometimes male cats get obstructed, they block their urinary tract, we can unblock them on that table. That's a pretty common emergency that we'll see um, in our emergency room. 
And this is very similar to human patients, it's just that it's much more condensed for us because our patients are smaller. Um, but we have the same capabilities that, that they do um, in the emergency setting. And then this is sort of a close-up of our oxygen uh, cage. And what's, I think, thinking about this to me was a little bit interesting because in, in people, if you've ever seen someone receive oxygen supplementation, they have either a mask over their face or they put nasal prongs in them. Well, as you could probably imagine, dogs and cats won't tolerate that. Mm -hmm. And believe us, we've tried it, and sometimes if they're sick enough and they're lying still, they'll tolerate it for a brief period of time. But the last thing we want is for a pet to come in the hospital and get more stressed out when they're already sick and stressed. We know that that is associated with poor outcome, and we want to make this experience as positive as possible, and certainly don't want to make them any worse. So what we do is we actually have to put them in an oxygen cage. And the way that this works is we basically put them in an environment with a higher enrichment of oxygen. So instead of breathing 21% oxygen, which is what we're normally breathing, these patients can breathe up to 100% oxygen in some of these cages. Generally speaking, we don't go that high, but at least 60% is about where we start. Um, and that can make them more comfortable if they're having a hard time breathing, they have any heart disease, lung disease, things like that. And they're much more comfortable in this setting than sticking a mask in front of their face. So the physical exam is how we go about the first part of evaluating your pets. And we do our exam to obviously determine what's going on, but also to figure out what diagnostics we're going to recommend to you so that we can move forward in coming up with a definitive diagnosis. Our exam, as I've mentioned, involves evaluating different body systems, listening to the heart, listening to the lungs, getting a temperature on your pet. On the right side of the screen, there is a doctor evaluating the gums or the mucous membranes of a patient that presented actually not too long ago. Um, this patient presented for having repetitive episodes of vomiting and was very, very dehydrated. And assessing the gums is a way for us to assess, in some ways, how dehydrated a patient can be when they present. And it can help us guide our fluid therapy for patients. Um, they can also see the color of the gums, which can help us determine what sort of fluids are required or recommended for them, or if they're in shock, or if they require other sort of therapies. One of the things about veterinarians is that we obviously can't talk to our patients. And it would be nice if we could come in, and they would present to the hospital, and we could ask them if they felt dizzy, ask them if they were short of breath, ask them if they ate your socks a couple of hours ago. But the reality of it is that we have limitations, and even though our training and our life is centered around interpreting animal behavior in the clinical setting, it's not always possible. Sometimes we don't know exactly what's going on. And that's why we have to recommend diagnostics to you so that we can get more information. Fortunately for us, technology has come a long way. We have the ability to do many, many things um, to get to the bottom of your pet's presenting complaint. And like many hospital settings, whether it's human or veterinarians, we can obtain blood samples, we can obtain urine. If we see fluid in inappropriate compartments in the body, we can also obtain fluid, run all of these things to the lab for evaluation to get to the bottom of what's going on, why these things are there, why we're seeing certain abnormalities on our physical exam. We also have the benefit of imaging. We can do things like x-rays. An x-ray allows us to see a shot in time of a particular cavity in the body or of a particular structure in the body. If we think an animal has a broken bone, we like to take an x-ray of that to confirm that, just like in a human hospital, we'll take x-rays. Humans sometimes utilize more advanced imaging modalities um, in the hospital setting. They have the benefit of not having to sedate patients and anesthetize patients in many settings. They can just say, lie still while we run you through the CT or run you through the MRI. With us, there's more risk in sedating or anesthetizing a very sick patient, and so we don't always jump to those modalities initially. But the x-ray is an extremely valuable part of our workup and can give us a lot of information about your pet's underlying problems. Then we also have things like the ultrasound machine. The ultrasound is, or the sonic sonography, um, however you um, have heard the term before, that machine is better for looking in body cavities and sort of it's more of a live view of what you're seeing. So you can see functionality, are the intestines moving? Is the bladder intact? Are we seeing any masses, free fluid in the chest or in the abdomen that shouldn't be there? It's a way of, of seeing more of the live picture, sort of the um, what is happening present moment rather than the x-ray, which is more of a shot in time. Both have their place, both 
are used um, in particular aspects of our, of our everyday job, um, but they're important in coming up with answers for, for what is going on. Other tools that we utilize, the, steth the stethoscope, I, I didn't wear mine um, here for lecture, but every doctor, every nurse, human, veterinary, otherwise, will wear a stethoscope. It's the instrument that is most helpful for any physical exam. It allows us to listen to the heart, listen to the lungs, um, and evaluate a patient's breathing, heart rate, heart rhythms, things like that. The cardiac monitors that we utilize are essential for being able to monitor patients even in the short term or even in the long term. So if we're concerned about a patient developing some sort of a dangerous heart rate or rhythm, we can monitor that on this particular machine. Um, this, these machines that we have in our hospital and in most hospitals, they work similarly, um, have the ability to measure blood pressure in the same, um, on the same screen. Uh, we can even measure how well a patient is, is breathing, how well they're ventilating by monitoring their CO2 output or how much they're breathing off the carbon dioxide. Um, so there's a lot of these machines can do and they're very helpful for the sicker patients so that we can kind of trend values and make sure that we're not getting into an area that we're more concerned about clinically for your pet. The crash cart, which I brought up earlier, sits in the very front of the room near our crash table. And this cart is an invaluable part of any emergency room. It is in every human hospital, every veterinary hospital in some form. And this cart contains drugs for any emergency situation. So if your pet comes in or a pet comes in that's maybe not breathing, maybe has no heart rate or rhythm, maybe um, has been hit by a car, has collapsed, maybe we don't have an air, we need to establish an airway, so get a tube down their throat and start breathing for them. All of the equipment, all the drugs necessary for any scenario that is emergent can be found in this crash cart. Now on top of the cart, you'll see there is a machine. Um, it's a kind of a small photo, but this is something that I'm sure all of you have seen in some capacity at some point, but if you've ever seen a movie or a TV show in a hospital setting where they pick up the paddles and they'll put them on the person's chest and, and yell clear and then shock them. That is defibrillator and that's what we use as well in certain scenarios for CPR. Um, and CPR refers to cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So it's any time we need to um, restart the heart or the lung system in the body. All of the things in this cart will allow us to accomplish that. Hope, at least that's our goal. Oftentimes, obviously, we're not successful, like in any aspect of medicine, but everything that we need is, is centralized into one location purposefully, so it's easy access. And then, we, if we're hospitalizing patients, we feel that they need IV medications or intravenous medications, we'll put an IV catheter in. And I think something that frustrates myself, as well as other people, is the fact that we have to shave patients to do various diagnostic tests. One of the luxuries in people is that they don't have to do that. Um, I realize that it, you know, you're coming to the hospital to have your pet feel better, not to get a new haircut. Um, but oftentimes, the only way we can get accurate diagnostic information and accurate um, imaging, get catheters in, things like that, we have to be able to get access to the skin. Even ECG pads to be able to watch heart rates on the monitor, we need to put ECG pads on their wrists and to get them against the skin is an important part of getting that to work effectively. Um, so bear with us, I know it's not ideal when you see your pets come back with um, shave spots on their bodies, but it's really the most efficient way for us to get answers that we need. All right, so what happens next? So once your pet has been evaluated, we need to make some decisions. Is your pet stable enough to go home with you that night or that day? Does your pet seem like it could benefit from being admitted to our hospital and receiving further therapy? Or do we feel that humane euthanasia is the best course of action? If you're going the outpatient route, if we feel that your pet is presented is stable, then we're gonna recommend that you take him home, him or her home, and monitor her. And at this point in time, we're going to get discharge instructions. This is a key part of the ER system is your discharge instruction because in these instructions are information about how to monitor your pet at home and what to look for, medications that we're going to prescribe to you, how much to give and when to give them, and then when to follow up and who to follow up with. All very important information to make sure that there is the highest chance that your pet will not come back into the ER, which is obviously what none of us want. If we decide that your pet needs to be admitted because it's sick enough. We will go through paperwork that involves consent to treat. We'll go over a plan, what service we intend to transfer your pet to. We'll go over costs with you. 
And then we will hospitalize your pet and transfer them to the appropriate service. And this is how it works in any hospital setting. When a patient comes into the ER, they're stabilized there, but definitive care happens in the department that they're presenting for their presenting complaint. So for example, if a person walks into a hospital having seizures, they're gonna be stabilized in the emergency room and then they'll go to the neurology service. Same way that it works for us. If we feel that your pet's care is best suited to be treated by an internal medicine specialist, they will be coming in through the emergency, we'll stabilize them, make sure that they're comfortable, and then the following day or the same day, they'll be transferred to the service that can best treat them definitively for their, for their ailments. Now our goal as doctors is to provide all of the options to you, even the ones that are hardest to hear, such as humane euthanasia. Sometimes letting your pet go is the right decision, and I say this to everyone that I have to recommend this option to, it is a luxury in our profession to be able to recommend euthanasia to people. In human medicine, that's not something that is done, obviously, but for us, we have the ability to relieve ultimate suffering from patients that we feel are terminal or too sick to get better. We recognize that this is a very, very difficult decision for owners, and we don't recommend this lightly. And it may seem like the concept of euthanasia or the process of euthanasia is something that's sort of routine for veterinarians, but I can tell you, even though we may act that way, some people may not seem as affected by it in the room, it is heartbreaking for us every time. And the way, the way that we can cope with it is knowing that we are doing a service to your pet and relieving suffering from them. The one aspect of medicine that I think is most challenging for all veterinarians is cost of care because we never want cost to influence decision making. We want what's best for your pets, period. The reality is that veterinary medicine is expensive. In order to provide the best care for your pet, in order to be a level one trauma center and have all the resources available for us 24 hours a day, it's expensive. We need high level technology and technology changes very quickly. In order to provide the information, to provide the best care, we need the best technology available to us when we need it. And that can be any hour of the day or night. That being said, we have utility bills to run a very large hospital 24 hours a day, and that also becomes expensive. Medications, housing different medications, different supplies in the hospital, that becomes expensive as well. And then staffing a hospital of this caliber where we're running every day of the year 24 hours a day, all these costs add up. We never want finances to play a role in the decisions for your pet. And I can promise you not one veterinarian in the world has picked this profession because of the money. We truly, truly do this because we want to help you and we actually love animals. We want to help your pets. But this, at the end of the day, is still a source of income for us and it's still a business. And we will do everything in our power to help your pets and to help you because that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. We love what we do. Um, but there are obviously limitations like in anything. The best advice that I can give you is to get health insurance for your pet. If there's one thing you take away from this presentation, get health insurance for your pet that covers emergency. Because even if you're perfect, even if your pet is perfect, the world is not. About three months ago, I lost my dog. She was running on the beach with a tennis ball in her mouth and she collapsed and she died instantly. And I tell you this story because someone once said, we as people, as living things, have, have a propensity to become ill, have a propensity to die. We are living, breathing, metabolizing organisms. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And you should always be prepared in a scenario so that when the time comes, if the time comes that you have to bring your pet into the emergency room, you're prepared. And, that, and the decisions that you're making are not based off of the cost, but based off of what's in the best interest for your pet. So with that, I will happily take any questions. Thank you all for being here, for listening today. I hope that you'll feel some more comfort coming into the emergency room when that time comes. Open it up, yeah. If your dog needs surgery, you know, how many people like Dr. Spector, my dog has seen him twice for surgery, are here, you know, in the middle of the night? 
if you need it? Are there it's a great question. So it varies by hospital. In our particular hospital yeah, setting, okay. <laughs> And this is actually how it works in most veterinary hospitals, truthfully. There's no, um, generally speaking, overnight, there is no surgeon present in the building. And so in an emergency scenario, we have the ability to get any surgeon in this hospital quickly if something is emergent. So depending on the stability of an animal that comes in the hospital, depending on how sick they are, how quickly we think they need to go to surgery, will that improve outcome or will maybe waiting for a couple of hours and giving them fluids, giving them antibiotics, blood products, will those things actually benefit them more? We have the ability to call a surgeon at any, at any given time and they will come into the hospital for an emergency surgery. How, how long will that? How long does it take for us yeah. to call them for them to get here? 20 minutes. Oh, that's it. I mean, because I know my dog has had surgery twice and he has cancer and I know Dr. Sure. Uh, but so when, when are the normal hours? It varies by service, and the, there's a lot of surgeons that work in the hospital, and they have they rotate their schedules too. So some surgeons will work four days a week, and they kind of rotate, and it varies. Um, but in the overnight setting, generally it's the surgery residents that are coming in to cut cases, okay. so they'll be doing the surgery. That being said, there is always a staff surgeon on call that can be either called to come in or consult over the phone if a, if a surgery seems like it's too complicated. And there's always times that, that happens. I mean, there's no, you know, if someone needs to come in to help, they will come in to help or be available to, to help over the phone. Generally speaking, the emergency surgeries that we see are, um, I wouldn't say routine, but I would say routine to our residents because they tend to be the sort of the same things that need to go to surgery on an emergency sure. basis. Right, and, and at night. Um, and so the, their surgery residents are, are pretty, uh, pretty good about knowing what to do, when to get in there, and, and do it quickly. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on the list you had uh, of the things that you always do in ER, um, one of them was a rectal exam. What would be the reason to do that if someone was coming in with an ear or an eye uh, problem? That's a great question. And the, the thing that I'll say about the rectal exam for a patient that doesn't seem to require that aspect of the exam is that sometimes patients that come in with an ERI problem may have something systemic causing that problem. Um, and one example of that are patients that have lesions in the back of their eye that may be causing inflammation or some sort of bleeding or redness around the eye. Well, that could be caused from a cancer somewhere else in the body. And there are a lot of rectal cancers that we can palpate on our rectal exam, that just being an example. Um, so being thorough with our exam actually allows us to find things that we may not normally find and may not even think about until we've actually done those things on our exam. So you're right, if, someone, if an animal comes in with a scratch on their eye and they're a young, healthy animal, that aspect of the exam may not be prioritized. And sometimes, in a very, very busy setting, that may not be done, but generally speaking, if we think that there's any inkling of a possibility that that could be related to something more systemic or more global on your pet, then we, we will do that because it does offer us a lot of information. There's actually, um, when I was an intern, one of the senior doctors said to me that there are 10 things that you should be able to find on a rectal exam, which actually seems crazy because how could you think of 10 things, but they're actually, I'm not gonna list them now. It's not because I don't remember them, um, but you actually can obtain a lot of information from doing a rectal exam, so I think it's an important aspect of the, of the complete physical. How many tables do you have in the ER in total? We have three tables total. Oh. Yeah, the first table is sort of the crash table or the, the stat table, so anything that comes rushing back. It goes right there, reason being that it's closest to all the instruments, it's next to the crash cart with all, with all the drugs in it, um, and anything that we need to instrument the patient with, or if we need to put catheters in, obtain an airway. Um, and then we have the middle table, which is just a general exam table, but it can serve as sort of a secondary crash table. And then our, our further table in the back of the room that's next to the oxygen cages is where we'll generally do any anesthetic procedures, because the anesthesia machine sits right there. Um, or if we're pulling a patient out of oxygen that we think can't, live very long comfortably outside of that higher oxygen content, we'll put them on that table, supplement them with oxygen, um, and then put them right back in the oxygen cage. So things are sort of strategically placed, and we know where we need to be with each individual patient to then not get anyone's way and maintain sort of a, a certain sanity in the, in the emergency room when it gets busy. 
Yes. What are your most common surgeries? And along with that, I thought tennis balls weren't good for dogs. What's that? I, you know, I've, I have heard that. I've had dogs my whole life. I've never had a problem. I don't think that was the reason that uh, we lost her, but um, I will say that the most common emergency surgeries that we see, is that, is that what you're asking about, um, would be things like um, a patient that has what we call a septic abdomen. So a patient that comes in that in some way has gotten an infection outside of their GI tract and into their abdominal compartment, um, if you think about the way the GI tract is, every organ system is well organized, well contained in sort of its own compartment. And if any of those compartments are compromised, then whatever is inside that compartment will leak out into the open abdomen. And so a septic abdomen means that there's some source of infection, whether it's from the GI tract, if the animal has a urinary tract infection, their bladder ruptures, anything that has an infectious component that leaks into the abdomen can be a source of a septic abdomen or an, an infected abdomen, and those are surgical emergencies. Um, sometimes we'll see um, bleeding patients, so patients that have a, a, a tumor on the spleen or on the liver that starts bleeding, the patient comes in, collapse at home, we put the ultrasound or the sonography on their abdomen to assess for, for fluid, we see fluid sitting in the belly, we obtain a sample and it's blood. And if those patients are actively bleeding, they need to go into the OR the, or the operating room and have that bleeding stopped um, sooner rather than later, obviously. Um, so those, I think, are two of the more common emergencies. And we see a couple of reproductive emergencies as well. Um, if, if animals come in and they're straining to, um, to pass their puppies or their kittens, generally cats don't have the problem. But for dogs that are having a hard time passing puppies, we need to go in and open them up and get the puppies out manually so they don't die. Um, dogs can get infections in their uterus, which also is an em it can be an emergency. Um, but those, are, I think, are the, probably the more common things that we'll see. Yes? Uh, yes, I have. Oh, okay, great. Uh, yeah, I, actually, mine is more of a commentary, but if you have any, um, you know, if you have any feedback, I'd be interested in hearing it. It's about insurance. Uh, I have, however, two pet rabbits. We're not talking dogs or cats here. And there's been a debate. There was only one insurance company, VPI, that was insure, you know, insure rabbits. And then they got bought out by Nationwide. Um, and the question has come up, not recently though, but in recent years, it's come up on various rabbit Facebook groups. Um, you know, somebody asking, I'm considering getting insurance for my rabbit. I know that I've got What's, and you know, it's running like 50-50. Half will say, yeah, it's coming useful. And the other half will say is, I spent all this money on insurance and I still had to shell out a lot of money for my rabbit. And you know, it's a headache. So I've never bothered. Every time I think I'm inclined that way, then you hear you know, several horror stories. So um, I don't know if you have any I feedback on that. The, the only thing I'll say, I think the best analogy I can give just thinking about it is if you buy, um, fire insurance for your home and at the end of the year your home doesn't burn down you don't say I wish I hadn't had fire insurance right and so I think it's true it's it, you pay by the month you have a healthy young animal that you don't expect to bring into the to the emergency room probably for many years if you're you know if they've never had any issues hopefully for many years but the reality is that when the time comes and I can't tell you the number of people it's countless that come in and the first thing they say to me is doc my, my dog's never been sick in her whole life and all of a sudden she's here and she collapsed at home and then you're in a, in a hole because you're presented with a six thousand dollar surgery bill and they're saying I can't afford this and that's not what we want for people we, we, we don't want that to be a determining factor now if, I'm sorry go ahead yes well the, the issue isn't uh, you know laying out the money and not you know using it the problem is laying out the money and then they don't cover right that's the issue. It's real. It's. I mean, really, with rabbits, that seems to be the issue. I don't. I don't know a lot about rabbits, to be honest with you. Um, I. I do feel that that is probably not just for rabbits, but it's a problem in many different insurance companies. Yeah, Non-cats and dogs. I mean, I think you have a lot. You have a lot of options. Yeah. With, with cats and dogs, and the rest of us, it's minimal. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but see again, like we're, right? Like but we're talking. See, we're talking rabbits though right, here. Right, I'm saying VPI. And they're and they got bought up by nationwide now. It's horrible. It's, it's horrible. 
Any other questions? Oh. In a human emergency room, one of the first things they ask is your level of pain. Yeah. What do you do in the ER here to assess, particularly when pets try to mask or hide any evidence of pain? It's a really good question. And again, one of the challenges of working with species that can't communicate that verbally. <laughs> Um, but there are a lot of things that we can assess on our exam, again, that can indicate pain, and they're not always so obvious. A lot of times owners um, will perceive certain things that they don't necessarily think are pain, but they t then on exam will have painful backs or painful limbs or be painful in the abdomen. Um, so I think the best way that we can do that is by being <coughs> thorough in, in evaluating all of our body systems. So palpating the, the joints, the bones, the abdomen, the spine, the back, a lot of dogs that come with back pain. And sometimes we can't elicit pain. And even though the history is consistent with a painful animal or you're seeing that your animal's not comfortable at home, um, it very well just could be that they're stoic or that they're very nervous or they are just, we're not eliciting pain in them. And so in some of those scenarios, if we can rule out other reasons for why they're in the hospital, and that can be a frustrating thing for owners too, because we'll, you know, in an exam room, if we don't know exactly what's going on, we'll say, I think your pet is painful, but there's a possibility that there's something else going on that we're just not able to assess at this point. So if you want to be safe, we can get some blood work, we can run electrolytes sort of right there in the emergency room. Full blood work tends to go upstairs to the lab and may take time to come back dur during overnight care. But during the day um, or during the night, if we need to make sure it's not something more insidious, then we will recommend doing more things. Alternatively, if it's a young pet and you don't wanna do that, we sometimes will just do a trial of pain medications to go a very short trial of pain medications. And, if, and with the stipulation, and this will be in discharges, that if your pet does not get better, or gets any worse, or you notice any progression, to bring him or her right back into the hospital. Um, so sometimes we have to kind of work off of what you're telling us, what we feel based on our exam, and then based on how aggressive you wanna be with diagnostic information. Um, and if we're not getting anywhere, then we will, and we feel that everything else is checked out okay, he or she is stable, then we'll try a short course of pain meds just to see if it works. Yes? You mentioned, that, you mentioned that often you go to surgery when you go to sepsis or infection of the abdomen. On people, uh, when we go to the emergency rooms, they usually do CAT scans. Is there any reason to consider a CAT scan rather than go straight to surgery for the pet? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, and oftentimes we will do CAT scans on patients, especially during the day. If For septic abdomens, um, they're usually not stable enough to undergo anesthesia to then go to the CT scanner. We want them in and out of the OR as quickly as possible, off of anesthetics as soon as possible. Um, but oftentimes for the more stable patients, let's say it's for a patient that may have cancer that's bleeding somewhere and we do think we have some time and we want to get either better surgical planning or assess for metastasis of some sort or distribution of cancer elsewhere in the body, we will run them to the CT, absolutely. If we have that luxury to do that, we will, but especially in overnight care or if a patient is rapidly decompensating or crashing, um, we, we, just, we just don't have the ability to do that yet. Um, the technology for CTs in our profession is actually, um, it's becoming much better very quickly and they're at all these conferences are now presenting different um, CT scanners that work faster and faster and faster that you may not even need to to barely sedate patients, just kind of put them in there and they roll them right through and within a couple of minutes you have a full <laughs> CT of the body. Um, but those things haven't quite caught on yet. Um, our sort of ultrasound, x-ray uh, modalities for, for assessing um, our sick patients tends to be still what we go to, especially overnight. But that would be, I mean, that's where we're headed, hopefully, at some point. Do you always fully sedate for CAT scans? Um, I think 
there's, there's varying degrees of sedation. So it depends on how rambunctious the patient is, how sick they are. Um, more recently, we've been um, scanning a lot of our trauma patients that have come in. So we're working on a, on a study now that actually evaluates trauma CTs um, to see if there's any benefit to doing just a CT versus doing the serial x-rays that we'll, be, that we'll do when they come in to evaluate for pelvic fractures, for rib fractures, contusions, air in the chest inappropriately. Um, and we're, we're working on that study now, and that's obviously something that we're hope to get to at some point, because in people, they utilize CT a lot more than we do. Um, but that being said, it's not always safe to sedate a very sick patient that is at risk for um, decompensating or uh, crashing. And one of the, the other thing I'll say is that our CT is on a different floor than our emergency room. It's on the eighth floor. So it's, we don't have the luxury of being able to run into the CT and stop it and, and help a patient that may not be doing well if they're on the other side of the hospital. Do you utilize MRI at all? We do. We utilize MRI. Um, <laughs> The MRI is more used for our neurologic patients if we suspect some sort of a, um, like vascular event or a tumor or a disc or something like that. Um, but in the trauma setting, in the emergency setting, the CT is, is more utilized for what we need it for. How do you balance being a learning center versus what might be futile care? Can you expand on that question a little bit? <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, it's all circumstantial depending on, on the animal and what their problem is. At what point does the ER make that decision or does it go to a specialist if they're not sure whether the care that they're recommending would be worthwhile? So I think the best way I can answer that question is to say that we as veterinarians need to just, we, we make the recommendations and provide all the options. And we're providing options from the gold standard of care to the most conservative care. And at the end of the day, it's up to you as the owner to do what, what you feel is in the best interest of your pet. We present what we think is in the best interest of your pet and hope that we can guide you to making a decision that would best benefit your, your dog or your cat or your rabbit. Um, the, I think there's, never a scenario where we're going to recommend something that we don't feel is appropriate and i don't think any i don't think anyone would or should do that i think the information that we're giving you is because and, and the way that we're guiding you is because we genuinely believe that these are appropriate things to do um, but I, I i don't think there's ever a scenario where you should feel like you're getting the wrong care and if you feel that way then you should definitely ask questions and, and get input. But the benefit of being in a hospital like this that has the learning and the education and the, the, um, the varying specialties is that we all work as a, as a group. And if someone is not sure about where to take a certain case or where to go diagnostically or therapeutically, we have the luxury of asking different services, of consulting with other people. And everyone does that every day here. I mean, this is a team effort. Our ICU is um, sort of the, the, the center to the critical patients. And we have different services that are housing their patients in there every day, coming in and asking our criticalists in f for advice on how we think they should proceed with particular cases. We may go and ask an, intense, uh, um, an internal medicine a service or the neurology service to evaluate particular patients that may have some sort of abnormality neurologically or that, that may need more long-term chronic management and that we're not as apt to do because of our nature of our sort of short-term working with patients in the more critical setting. So everyone works as a team and everyone um, is happy to get information from other places in the hospital. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone.